Littlehampton, on the Sussex coast on a summer's day. It was here that Sarah and Michael Payne brought their four children on July the 1st, 2000. It was a lovely day. It was, it was sunny, it was hot. It was about seven in the evening, I suppose. Got down to the beach and the children wanted to stay at the beach, so we stayed for a little while. It was a day out to see their grandparents, who lived a few hundred yards away. Hard to believe that what happened that day would have such shocking repercussions. Then the boys said, could they stay? And the girls asked if they could stay. And normally I would have just said, you know, no. The beach was empty, so I said yes, you know, wrongly, but I said yes. Mum and Dad left their four children, Sarah, her sister and two brothers, on the beach and went for an evening stroll, stopping off at the local pub on the way back. I shouldn't have left on the beach, I did. I didn't get home. As a parent, you make decisions no matter what and you have to live with those decisions, unfortunately. But that is what I live with. The walk back to their grandparents, Terry and Leslie, across fields and down a country lane should have taken the children no more than a couple of minutes. From the time we left the house to the time we got back, it was about an hour. Got back to the house and... Um, Les just looked at me in a strange way and said, Is Sarah with you? And I said no, and it was that immediate panic. I went up to the end of the lane, but I just sensed that she definitely wouldn't have gone any further than that. So then it was back along the lane and it was calling all the time, shouting all the time. We just kept looking. You know when you lose your child in a supermarket and you can't find them, but you kind of know they're around the next corner? It was like that bit intensified. It, it felt wrong. To be honest, I thought she was hurt somewhere. Lee, the Payne's 13-year-old son, had been the last person to see Sarah as they crossed the field towards their grandparents' house. Lee said that his sister had stumbled, then disappeared from view, and he'd seen something else, too. Now, Lee knows cars, and he knows vans, and, he can, and he's got a very good memory. He said to me that he'd seen a white van. And Lee turned out to be the best witness that we had. It was just beginning to get dusk, and Sarah was terrified of the dark. And there's no way she'd want to be outside in the dark. There's just no way. Um, so that's when we made the call. It's an emergency. What's the problem? Um, I've lost my eight-year-old daughter. She's been missing about an hour and three quarters now. All right. And was she playing with anybody at all? She was playing with her brothers and her little sister, and she sort of walked away from them. And what's the name of the little one that's missing? Sarah. Every minute was, you know, like a ticking clock. It was just awful. I don't think any of us slept that night. Truly believed that we would get home. In fact, I never doubted it for one second. In the immediate hours after Sarah's disappearance, police were keeping an open mind. Had she just wandered off soon to be found, or had something more sinister happened? In his statement to police, Lee Payne said that not only had he seen a white van, he also gave a description of what the driver looked like. It was a man, unshaven, with yellow teeth, and wearing a check shirt. At that time, I was a detective inspector in the Little Hampton area and had responsibility for a range of functions, including gathering intelligence on criminals and the management of sex offenders. The briefing that I gave my team was that they were to knock on the doors of the sex offenders who might have committed an offence like this, who in those circumstances tend to be very compliant. They'll do what they're told. Ask them where they were when Sarah had gone missing and hopefully, with their consent, actually get into their flat house um, and search it. The day following Sarah Payne's disappearance and a massive search was underway. There were helicopters and police and people from the village. I think there was two, three hundred volunteers, just people coming from everywhere just, just to look. 
But I just didn't think anyone could harm her. I just felt that she would have talked anyone out of hurting her. Sunday evening, and police knocked on the front door of a 41-year-old car mechanic who lived a few hundred yards from the Littlehampton seafront. Police wanted to know his whereabouts when Sarah had gone missing. His name was Roy Whiting. He said he'd been in Littlehampton. He travelled across to the Brighton Hove area to a fun fair, and had then travelled straight back. But the sort of answers that he was giving were very nervous ones. So they came away and um, just went around the corner and telephoned uh, my sergeant who telephoned me. In the meantime, Whiting came out from his address, went round the corner to South Terrace, the seafront road, to a white van. Whiting had bought the white Fiat van just a few days before Sarah's disappearance. Police also had doubts about his alibi, which didn't seem to add up. He claimed he'd driven straight back from Brighton, yet in his van was a receipt from a petrol station putting him 10 miles north of the route he said he had taken to get home. On what basis did we arrest him? Nervousness on his part. He gave us an alibi that we weren't happy with. Um, so we were stretching things as it, as it was to get him in custody. But there was another reason why Roy Whiting was a suspect. In 1995, Whiting had been convicted for an indecent assault on an eight-year-old girl in Crawley, 35 miles away. Cruising around the town on a winter's afternoon, he had bundled the girl into his car before taking her to a wooded area and assaulting her. He would then dropped her home. Roy Whiting was well known to Paul Williams. He had interviewed him in Littlehampton when he was released from prison after serving half of his five-year sentence. This is a man who had committed uh, a serious predatory offence against a little girl. He just had no appreciation or understanding, really, of what he'd done, why he had done it, and whether he would do it again. After his release, Whiting had been seen hanging around a local swimming pool. Police put him under surveillance in case he tried to commit another offence. My conclusion was that you know, he, he posed a significant risk. Uh, I didn't put it in terms of high, medium or low. There had to be a chance that he would do that again. Roy Whiting was just one of hundreds of sex offenders questioned about Sarah Payne's disappearance. Desperate to find her, her parents appealed to whoever might be holding their daughter. Let her go. Let her go. Or her if, go. if you know that someone's got an extra child somehow, or, yeah. or, or whatever, you know, get in touch with your local police, you know? Look around you, everybody. Everybody, just look around you. As Sarah's parents made their appeal, Roy Whiting was being questioned. Right, well, Whiting gets interviewed. Uh, the problem is there's not a great deal to interview him about. Uh, we've still just got a missing girl. How far away from her were you in your vehicle when you first saw her? No, coming here. What side of the road was she walking on? No, coming here. At what stage did you decide that you were gonna you were gonna take her? No, coming here. I mean, was it was it a planned thing, or was it an instantaneous act? Over three days of questioning, Roy Whiting maintained a defiant no comment. There was nothing the police could do. My experience has led me to absolutely know there's only one way to investigate something, and that is to keep an open mind at all times. Now, is there anything that you don't understand about what I've asked you over the past few days? There was strong circumstantial evidence, but we didn't have enough evidence to charge him. Roy Whiting was released, but police kept hold of his van. They wanted to carry out forensic tests on its contents. Meanwhile, the search for the missing eight-year-old, Sarah Payne, carried on. It just didn't feel right. It just felt wrong. It was just loud and noisy, just a normal family, and two boys, two girls, and so they were kind of like, 
why haven't you got her back yet? You're the person that we trust. Why isn't she home? And I couldn't answer, and I just kept saying, she'll be home soon, she'll be home soon. That's all I could say. July the 4th, 2000. It was now 72 hours since Sarah Payne had gone missing while on a day out to the Sussex coast with her family. The search for the eight-year-old girl was now nationwide and becoming increasingly desperate. There were even reports that she had been sighted more than 200 miles away in Cheshire. I walked in on day three of the inquiry and that's when I first met Sarah. There was no margin for error with Sarah Payne. Her daughter was alive, end of. We've got just over 500 actions now. So that's 500 different jobs that we've gone out to do in trying to find Sarah. None of us were ever allowed to talk about anything other than Sarah coming home alive. We always imagined, every time we looked at a camera, that Sarah was looking back. And that if she could see doubt in our mind, she would worry and she'd be scared. We're trying to stay as positive as we possibly can, you know? And Sarah, if you're watching, Mommy loves you. And we miss you. And we're looking for you, darling, and we're going to find you. OK? We're going to find you. And you'll be home. You'll be home, darling. Uh, yeah, I'm still hopeful. We've got to we be, We've got to keep our, try and keep our spirits up in some way. Well, I remember when we walked out of the press conference, a police officer uh, in um, an informal chat, really, made reference to the fact, um, I think he used the words, God forbid, if the worst has happened. Um, and Sarah had absolutely exploded and said, you know, don't ever talk about that in front of me. Wouldn't allow anyone to say that, anywhere near me. If that's your thought, go away. Take it away. I don't need anything negative or anything nasty. She doesn't need to see that and I don't need to hear it because I didn't want that getting through to her. Codenamed Operation Maple, the search for Sarah Payne was and still is the biggest investigation that Sussex Police has ever mounted, bigger even than the Brighton bomb. Nearly one third of its officers were involved in the hunt for the missing schoolgirl. It was a massive job, no question about it, massive. And it cost £3 million, which is a significant amount of money. I would do briefings in the morning with detectives and there'd be 90 officers. Following his initial arrest and questioning, Roy Whiting left Littlehampton. He remained the prime suspect and his van was still being examined, but police lacked any firm evidence to link him with Sarah Payne's disappearance. Whiting returned to Crawley, scene of his earlier offence against an eight-year-old girl, to live with his father. He was now under round-the-clock surveillance. The primary reason for uh, putting him under surveillance was that if Sarah was alive, he could lead us to her. She could have been a, in a building somewhere, in a, in a, locked up in a caravan somewhere. He also could have got rid of the clothes or some other evidence. I didn't want him to leave the country. I wanted to know where he was 24 hours a day. As with all major hunts for missing children, police were running the media campaign, hoping that the daily coverage would jog someone's memory. But that meant coming up with new angles and fresh stories to keep Sarah Payne's disappearance in the public eye. I said to her, we're playing a game here. We have got to keep this in the news. It gets your daughter back. It solves my inquiry. Every day, we need a new angle to this, Sarah. Otherwise, we'd stop going on the TV. I knew that this was the only way to keep Sarah um, in people's hearts and minds. Um, and until she was brought home, that's exactly what I was going to do. Sarah, if you're watching, please come home. Um, family's not the same without you. It's just a massive gap in between everybody. Our little princess has been not with us for two whole weeks now. We miss her terribly. Every day gets a little bit harder. Every hour gets a little bit harder. What I had to do was I had to give everyone looking into a TV set and everyone reading a paper, my daughter. And that's what I did, because I knew it was the only way I could make people want to help. I didn't want them to see a child on the screen in front of them and think, oh, I wanted them to become part of it. 
I wanted them to hurt as much as I was hurting, so that they searched as hard as I searched. Ironically, just as we were running out of ideas to keep it in the news, uh, Sarah's body was found. On Monday morning, July the 17th, 2000, in a field opposite Brinsbury College, 15 miles from Littlehampton, came reports of the discovery of a little girl's body. I was at Littlehampton Police Station uh, with most of my team at that point, and we heard that uh, a body had been found just off the A29 road. A member of the public had been walking through the field and had stumbled across uh, a body in a shallow grave. So I gathered my team together and uh, we sped up there and I initially took charge of, of the scene. And the way it was explained to me was her body has been found, it's a little girl and Sarah's the only one that's missing. Oh, it was just, it, and it's like slow motion. I can still see it all in, in like this slow motion with no sound. Um, and really, to be honest, I don't think I really had time to absorb it um, or take it in. Sarah had not been buried very well. Um, she had been exposed to the elements for 17 days. And um, or what was there wasn't a small child. Um, that's the only way I can put it. It's what nightmares are made of. No police officer ever wants to work on a, on, on a child murder. It's, you know, we're all parents. Right from the start, despite Sarah's emotive pleas and fantastic heartfelt belief that her daughter was alive, most of us knew she wasn't. And so we were already gearing up for the scenario of Sarah being found dead long before that body was found. It was now a murder inquiry. A hunt for a killer, a search for evidence and clues, however small. The body uh, was just over there, five yards away. There was a full forensic team there was every ologist known to man that was here just to try and get some sort of forensic evidence. One of the saddest days ever. Following the discovery of Sarah's body, the public's response threatened to overwhelm the investigation. We had a thousand messages coming in a day from the public. I couldn't possibly read a thousand messages, so we had a team of detectives prioritising those messages into ABC. Everybody wants to help. You've got to sort out the wood from the trees. Amid all the less useful information coming in, much of it just tying up resources, one find was to prove hugely significant. Deborah Bray lived three miles away from the murder scene. Two days after Sarah had disappeared, there was a little shoe in the middle of the road, which was brand new, and um, it alerted me. I thought some little one from Coolham School had probably thrown it out the car window. And it must have been there three or four days. It's when it wasn't there anymore. And I assumed that maybe someone had picked it up. Two weeks later, and Deborah Bray heard on the radio about the discovery of Sarah's body in a nearby field and recalled seeing the little shoe in the middle of the road. When the body was found, I rang the police straight away, and whoever it was on the phone said, oh, well, can you go and see? I walked down the road um, looking for the shoe and found it in amongst the grass in, under the hedge, quite a way in. So it had been knocked quite away by cars passing. It took quite a lot of looking for. I picked it up very gingerly with my little finger and took it back to the car and then drove to Brinsbury, um, where I knew the police were. It would be several weeks before anyone realised the significance of what Deborah Bray had found. I'm a senior forensic biologist in the Forensic Science Service and I deal with usually offences against the person, so murder, rape, 
uh, and in this case, the abduction of a little girl. Like the police, Ray Chapman and his team were overwhelmed with information. And at first, the hunt for clues seemed to be going nowhere. There's pressure in the sense that police want things very quickly, but they also know how many items they've submitted to the laboratory. And in this case, in total, there was over 500 items submitted. So they do have some idea that things are going to have to take a little while. July the 20th and Sarah's family visit the site where her body was discovered. I wanted Sarah to be remembered. I wanted everyone to remember what happened to this little girl when she went and played on a field. I didn't want her just to disappear into to nothingness and for all those people that had helped search, helped look and written to us, for them to forget. We had pretty good information from police sources, let's you know, make no bones about it, that th this was almost certainly the work of, of a, you know, a local predatory high-risk paedophile. The important thing was that out there were an extraordinarily large number of people who, to a greater or lesser degree, posed a threat to the safety, the welfare, even the lives of children. And so out of that evolved very quickly the idea that we should liaise with Sara and her family and see whether or not they would want to join us uh, in a campaign. It was time that somebody stood up and said, you know, if you can't keep them in prison and if you can't um, monitor these people, you better start letting us know that they're there. So we took polls, we conducted some polls, and they came in at between 80 and 90% of the people who were polled who said, yes, we believe these people should be identified, they should be named, they should be shamed. The decision to publish the names and the faces of 50 paedophiles convicted of offences against children was massively controversial. Critics accused the News of the World of inciting vigilante justice. And sure enough, there were attacks, not just on those who had been convicted of offences against children. Innocent people were also targeted, including in South Wales, a female paediatrician whom protesters had confused as a paedophile. But the News of the World campaign touched a nerve all over the country. I don't blame them for being angry the way that they were. I'm not surprised that they demonstrated in the way they were, and I'm not surprised they were as angry as they were. And I think, to be honest, had it been me at that time, I probably would have reacted in exactly the same way. More than one million people signed a petition demanding that the government change the law disclosing the whereabouts of known paedophiles. The demands for a so-called Sarah's Law, a lasting tribute to Sarah Payne, continued. As for Roy Whiting, the prime suspect for Sarah's murder, police were about to get the break they'd been hoping for. We're going north, north, speed is 70 miles an hour. We have our lights on, vehicles refusing to stop. It was never a manhunt for Roy Whiting. From the beginning, uh, Roy Whiting just kept coming up, just kept, was there from the start and just didn't go away. Following the discovery of Sarah Payne's body, Roy Whiting, the prime suspect in the case, had gone on the run but was still under surveillance. He had left his father's house in Crawley, where he'd committed a previous offence against a young girl, after bricks were thrown through the window. Whiting was now sleeping rough. But in the small hours of Sunday the 23rd of July, six days after Sarah Payne's body had been discovered, things were to change dramatically. A white Vauxhall Nova was reported stolen in Crawley. He was seen to go to this vehicle. He was seen to change the plates, uh, the number plates, and then he was seen to drive off. A patrol car was diverted to stop the Vauxhall and its driver, none other than Roy Whiting. There's one male in it. So a decision was made uh, for a marked vehicle to, uh, to stop him. And at that point, the chase started. In a desperate bid to get away, at one stage, Whiting reversed the Vauxhall down a dual carriageway. One mile in it, vehicles now going south, south. 
London Road on the northbound carriageway. Going south past the uh, BP garage. Gone down to the back of Allied Carpets. Back of Drove like a, uh, an absolute maniac. Carpets, down he goes. And he could cause the death of someone. We're into the car park. County Oak Industrial Estate going a right, 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 right into an unmade road. There we go. Going down to the back of Langley Walk. Back of Langley Walk. We have a warning light come up on our car. We believe it might be damaged. We may have to call off this follow. More police were now in pursuit. Whiting then dumped the stolen Vauxhall and ran off across fields. But he was then arrested by other officers. As far as I was concerned, Whiting being arrested was manna from heaven. I was delighted to see that he was then remanded in custody uh, because then I knew where he was, uh, he was going nowhere and he couldn't abduct another child, he couldn't assault another child or couldn't, God forbid, murder another child. Whiting was sent to prison for the theft of the car. In custody, the police had time to question him, but they were under intense pressure to get results from the very top. I've never worked on an inquiry where Downing Street phone up for an update. Uh, but that's what was happening. You know, every week we get a phone call saying the Prime is asking what's happening with the Surrey Pine case. And slowly but surely, the investigation was making progress. The focus was now on a minute examination of the black shoe that had been found in a hedgerow close to where Sarah's body had been buried. The usual way of retaining fibres is to use a piece of sellotape and then the stickiness of the tape will pick up any fibres that are on the outside of the clothing. And you can't do that with a Velcro strap because the Velcro will just hold onto the fibres. So an assistant had to sit down and, and carefully pick off each fibre individually using a pair of forceps. So that took quite a while and we ended up with two or three hundred fibres mounted up individually. A Velcro, in my book, is the most wonderful material in the entire world for catching murderers because the fibres stick to it like there's no tomorrow. And however uh, the, the shoe is mistreated and rained upon and, and kicked about and run over, the fibres are still there. On August the 31st, the funeral of Sarah Payne took place at her local church in Hersham in Surrey. Sarah was very much a girl. She wanted dresses on um, and didn't like trousers. Everyone bought her pink. Her ability to forgive and her ability to love, I think, were just fantastic. When we buried her, we gave her the funeral that a princess should have because I'd never give her the wedding that she could have. That's why the funeral became as it was. I didn't know what to write, so I just wrote to Sarah. Dear Sarah, ever since you came bounding into our lives at two in the morning, with no phone in the house, one tooth in your head, and a smile that could melt ice, we loved you. You were a joy that made our lives full. Daddy called you princess, because that's just what you are. Despite all the circumstantial evidence against Roy Whiting, the police still didn't have enough evidence to charge him with Sarah's murder. Hopes were pinned on the forensic scientists. They spent five months analysing samples taken from the Velcro on Sarah's shoe and comparing them with items found in Whiting's van. Among them, his red sweatshirt found in the front seat. The shoe was paramount. Um... Uh, this little tiny ladybird shoe that had been kicked up and down the road for days and days and weeks, it was the key to the conviction of Roy Whiting. The real breakthrough was when we found a fibre on the Velcro strap that matched the fibres that made up the fabric of the red sweatshirt in the van. Now we did that by comparing the two fibres under a comparison microscope. One of these slides has sample of fibres from the red sweatshirt found in Roy Whiting's van. Put that under one side of the microscope. 
The other slide contains fibres picked off from the shoe, which is thought to be from Sarah Payne. So these are the fibres that were trapped on the Velcro. We put that down the other side of the comparison microscope. So what you can see on the monitor now is a red fibre taken from Sarah Payne's shoe. And on the monitor you can see the exact shade of red and you might just be able to make out very small particles within the fibre that stop it being too shiny. On the other side we have a fibre from the red sweatshirt that was found in Roy Whiting's van and you can see that it's exactly the same shade of red, it's got the same cross section and it also has the small particles that stop the fibres becoming too shiny. Over the next few weeks, further tests confirmed the initial results. The fibre from the shoe had come from the red sweatshirt found in Roy Whiting's van. Each one of those processes takes four weeks. So you can imagine, it's not like CSI. <laughs> it's a long, long, slow process and it takes a long time. It's frustrating and it's um, heart-wrenching at times. That link between Sarah's shoe and Whiting's red sweatshirt was just the first breakthrough. Once the red sweatshirt was indicated by the fibres, I could then go ahead and test all the hairs that we found on the sweatshirt, which amounted to 40 hairs, which is an awful lot of DNA testing to do on one item. But in the end, it was worth it, because although 39 of those hairs gave no DNA profile whatsoever, one single hair gave a profile that matched fully back to Sarah Payne. The scientific evidence was totally crucial. For the entire length of the inquiry, I've been keeping, fighting to keep an open mind, fighting everyone else to keep an open mind. Uh, but now, but now I knew, I knew Roy Whiting had killed Sarah Payne, definitely. On February the 6th, 2001, Roy Whiting was arrested while in prison when about to complete his sentence for the earlier theft of the car and brought back to Sussex. It was never a case of getting anybody for murdering Sarah. I didn't want anybody in prison. I wanted to know that the person that went to prison was definitely the person, 100% sure, absolutely no doubts. Roy William Whiting, I'm Detective Sergeant Hinchcliffe and I'm going to charge you. You are charged with the offence that I'm going to read out below. You don't have to say anything but it may harm your defence if you do not mention now something which you later will learn in court. I wanted you to be able to look at that man in the eye, for a jury to be able to say you're guilty, and for a judge to be able to say you're going to prison. And after that, for him to go and rot in hell as far as I'm concerned and just never, ever be seen or heard of again. You are charged that on Saturday, the 1st of July 2000, at Kingston Gorse, West Sussex, you unlawfully took or carried away Sarah Evelyn Isabel Payne against her will, and that's contrary to common law. You are also charged that between Saturday the 1st of July 2000 and Monday the 3rd of July 2000 at Kingston Gorse, West Sussex, or elsewhere, you murdered Sarah Evelyn Isabel Payne. On November the 13th, 2001, Roy Whiting faced a jury at Lewis Crown Court. I was about to see the man that had murdered my daughter. I threw up about two or three times in the morning. I had had nightmares for I don't know how long. And when he came up from the cells and he was this little, dirty, unkempt man that wasn't a monster, that wasn't this thing that I could possibly ever be scared of in my life. And I knew that the only reason that that man picks on children is because there is no way an adult would have him anywhere near him.
Before the jury, Whiting claimed he knew nothing about Sarah's disappearance. He claimed he had forgotten precise details of his movements that night and said he'd been set up by the police. I have never been as confident of getting a conviction from anyone. But after three days with the jury being out, I didn't quite have that confidence. I was with Sarah when we got called back into court. We went into court. I don't think I've ever been quite as nervous as I was at that particular stage. And uh, this wonderful young forewoman uh, of the jury, she was asked, uh, how did you find the defendant? And she said in the clearest, loudest voice, guilty. And uh, that was such a relief. When they came through with guilty, I remember a woman on the, on the jury, just, she just cried, just absolutely cried. And for me, it was a sense of relief, absolute relief. And then the judge went into um, all the details, the absolute details of his previous. And that was just horrendous. Before passing sentence, Judge Richard Curtis told Whiting, you are and will remain an absolute menace to any little girl, and you are every parent's and grandparent's nightmare come true. Then he made the revelation that the psychiatrist who had seen Whiting after his previous attack had warned that he was a high-risk repeat offender. Sarah's murder had proved the psychiatrist right, the judge said. Hearing that, it's like a knife ripping right the way through. Absolutely. Um, it was like somebody telling me what had happened to my daughter. Moments after Whiting was taken to the cells, Sarah and Michael Payne faced the world's media. This doesn't make us happy, but justice has been done. Sarah can rest in peace now. But let's make sure that this stops happening time and time again. People are being let out of prison when everybody concerned knows that this is going to happen again. Sarah, Michael, can you describe that moment when you heard the verdict? I thought of Sarah and nothing else. Come along, Cap. The judge recommended that Whiting spend the rest of his life in prison. I know that there are bad people out there. I know that it was a case of, you know, wrong place, wrong time for her. What I was absolutely devastated and what really knocked me flying was the fact that he'd done it before. I am told constantly that it doesn't happen very often, but I am constantly reminding if it only happens to one child, it is too many. Since the death of her daughter in July 2000, abducted and then murdered while on a family day out, Sarah Payne has fought tirelessly for a change in the law. For parents, schools and carers to have the right to know that convicted paedophiles are in their local area. The government has now agreed that a trial version of the so-called Sarah's Law will be introduced in four areas of England. Sarah's Law is basically it's about predatory paedophiles. It's about people that are whiting. If a predator lives in your community, you should be able to go and ask and somebody should tell you that he is there or she is there. Over the years, Sarah Payne has tackled anyone with influence to get what she believes in and provide a lasting tribute to her daughter. If I had known Roy Whiting lived in that area, there is no way my children would have been out to play. That would have saved my daughter's life. The night that we were knocking on the door of uh, Roy Whiting and, uh, and arrested him, uh, we, we went to probably um, ten other houses to speak to sex offenders. I'm not saying any one of those could have committed this offence, but um, you know, there, there are a lot of sex offenders. Today there are 30,000 people on the sex offenders register, but that figure doesn't take account of the thousands of others who may have committed offences and gone undetected. How do you effectively monitor those numbers? 
do you put 24-7 uh, surveillance um, teams onto them? It sounds great, but the resource implications of just looking at one sex offender to that level of scrutiny are enormous. Today, Sarah Payne is returning to Lewis Crown Court, the first time she's been back there since Roy Whiting was convicted for her daughter's murder in December 2001. She's talking to court volunteers about how to deal with the victims of crime. First time? Yes, first time I've been first time that you've come back to Lewis Crown Court. The events so. of the last few years have taken their toll on Sarah Payne. She lost her daughter, and she and her husband, Michael, are now divorced. The stuff that I do for Sarah's law, many people have said to me, why don't you just walk away? It's obviously a price that's too high. The point is, if everyone does that, then nothing ever changes. You know, it's, it's like, I believe I'm doing this because I believe it's the right thing to do. She's sharing a platform with Martin Underhill, Tosh, one of the senior detectives involved in the case, to talk about their own experiences and the lessons to be drawn from one of this country's most notorious murder investigations. I meet many families on a daily basis and I meet many families throughout the course of my work. Um, where because they're not treated in the same way as we were, they are, are very fallen and very broken, and a lot of that's to do with the fact that they weren't listened to or they didn't get justice. Tosh and I had a very honest relationship. I had asked Tosh in very, very early days, please, please be honest, don't lie to me. Honesty is most definitely the best policy, don't you think? The most difficult time I had with Sarah was the honesty over Roy Whiting. Um, he was arrested on the Sunday, the day after Sarah went missing. It wasn't the fact that someone had been arrested, it was the fact that um, this man had done it before. Uh, and we had to tell her. Um, and there were a lot of tears um, and a lot of anger. And she actually said to me, I want to know exactly what he did. And that was awful. That was a very difficult moment. Um, it was horrible to hear, but I had to know the details. And had Martin lied to me at that point, that would have been the end of our relationship. The girl was actually taken from Kingston Lane, wasn't she? No comment. In the years since Roy Whiting was convicted for the murder of Sarah Payne and sent to prison for life, there are still unanswered questions. Sarah, I want to help find her. To this day, Whiting has always refused to cooperate with the police. Yes, yeah. no comment. The sad thing is at the moment we don't know how exactly Sarah died, or why. I write to him every year on the anniversary of his conviction uh, and ask him if he was prepared to speak to the police. So far, he has never responded to those letters, um, but we will continue writing those letters um, for the foreseeable future because I think the family and the police force have a right to know what happened. I'm used to having that pain in my life, so there's, it's, it's duller than it was, but it's always there. It's silly things that set it off. Such silly things. It's things like, uh, just before Christmas, I walked around to the shop and there was a young lad there who's, uh, well, they're 16 now, 17, and he's so tall. And he was Sarah's kind of boyfriend, if you like, you know, their first little boyfriend in school. And it was just, I was so upset when I got back, I just couldn't help but cry because I've been robbed of that. 